Hi, this is Jim Torrey. I'm the director of the Ivis Core Lab at St. John Hospital Medical Center in Detroit. And this is the SYNC case study of the month. First, the history of the patient is a 66-year-old with a chief complaint of unstable angina, history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a previous stent uh, at an outside institution, which we do not have uh, any information on. Uh, patient also has a history of hiatal hernia repair, reflux, cataract surgery, laminectomy, and Barrett's esophagitis, uh, a very remote smoker. His medication, uh, he's on Zocor, Protonix, Ecotrin, Lisinopril, uh, Drizdol, Calcium, and Metoprolol. The physical exam is unremarkable. E by echo, the EF is 55%, otherwise unremarkable, and the EKG is normal. Here's the initial LV gram. Uh, you can see the left ventricular function is well preserved. Here's the left coronary artery uh, in the uh, AP caudal projection in which you see um, a stenosis in OM2 uh, in the proximal segment, uh, which is tubular lesion, concentric, approximately 70 to 80%, about 15 millimeters in length. Here is the AP cranial projection in which we see um, an LED stent uh, going across diagonal three um, and then a stenosis proximal to the mid LED stent uh, with a 60 to 70% stenosis and diffuse disease to the proximal LED. Here's the RCA projections in LAO and AP cranial. And here we see uh, the RCA proximal has a uh, tubular lesion in the proximal to mid segment, uh, 50 to 60 percent stenosed, and a mid PDA lesion, focal, concentric, and 70 percent. So the question is, what do you do? Uh, there are multiple ways to approach this patient. You could stent the LED, stent the OM2. Uh, you could treat medically, you could use pressure wire on any of the three vessels, or use intravascular ultrasound. I, I think for our uh, purposes, pressure wire is the better choice, and so we did first the LED, um, and the LED showed up at uh, 0 0.76 at 60 seconds, uh, running at 140 mics per kilo per minute. And then we did the circumflex, uh, which was also positive at 0 0.80, at 65 seconds. Um, so both of those were physiologically significant. So the first thing we looked at is the LAD. This is the LAD sync shot. Uh, we are using the sync system uh, and the still frame sync image that we used uh, is to the right in which you can actually see the IBIS catheter uh, near the radio opaque marker of the, of the wire and then the three dots proximal. Uh, these are all 10 millimeters apart. So when you're trying to do a, a sink, uh, there's a couple things to remember. The first is you don't need the IVUS catheter to actually be downstream to do that sink shot. Uh, you, and this is actually important because sometimes the IVUS catheter will actually kick the guiding catheter out, uh, in which case you're not going to be able to get nice pacification of the vessel. It's more important to have the vessel well opacified than it is to have the IVUS catheter down it. The markers on the IVUS catheter are important during the live pullback under fluoro. They're not important for the initial angio. Uh, the second thing is, and this is one of the most important things actually, is that you need a steady pullback all the way to the guide. Don't stop or speed up or slow down uh, once, uh, once you're proximal to the lesion. When you're doing a pullback, uh, typically with IVUS manually, you tend to slow down at the site of the lesion because it's interesting to look at. And then once you're proximal to it, uh, in an area that's not of interest to you, you tend to speed up uh, to get it to the guide so you can look at the images. Uh, when you're trying to do uh, a sink, uh, you actually cannot do that. You have to be steady all the way to you see the guide, under live fluoro, and once you hit stop, that's when you stop. Um, the next thing, the most important thing, uh, 
uh, is that once you fix an angle so that you can see guide, uh, the tip of the wire, and the lesion and area that you want to concentrate on, you can't move anything. So that means that you can't move the II, uh, you can't move the II height, the table height, uh, the table position, nothing. So the angle that you pick and the position that you pick has to be one that you're going to be comfortable working on for the rest of the procedure if you can want to continue using uh, the sync uh, imaging. Uh, the last thing is once you've actually obtained uh, uh, a sink on the uh, angio and ibis, uh, it, it's very important that you actually document or, or figure out whether or not it's it's successful. And by successful, that means that it's reflect the ibis is reflective of the vessel at the particular spot you're touching the vessel. And to do that, uh, I would concentrate, and I always concentrate on side branches. So I will click on a side branch and see if I can actually see the corresponding side branch by ibis within the same image. Uh, if you can do that in multiple spots, then you know that you've got a very good sync. So here's the uh, uh, LAD IVIS, and we're going to start very distal near the apex. And the first thing we notice is there is a very short and really under-expanded stent in the mid to distal LAD that we couldn't see by angio. Here's the mid LAD stent crossing that diagonal three and then we are basically facing a diffuse geographic miss involving the entire proximal uh, and mid LAD, uh, but the ostium looked relatively spared. So this is the co-registration image, and when we actually got, come up into the screen, the first thing we want to do is make sure that the uh, sync is accurate. So the first thing we look at are these branches. So if you look on the image on the right, you'll see the angiogram, and that bar uh, is represented. It's supposed to be representative of the IVIS image that you see to the left. So at that bar, you can see a small septal perforator, um, which is also the septal perforator that we see on the IVIS image. So this is pretty good. Let's go a little more proximal, and here we see the diagonal three and right where the angiogram shows the diagonal 3, IVIS also shows uh, uh, the corresponding image. So this is good to hear. Next let's go up to the septal perforator, that large septal perforator more proximal. So here's the septal perforator more proximal. You can see the septal perforator right here and that bar is actually sitting right on the septal right here. So this is good all the way through. Um, so we would consider this to be a very successful uh, co-registration. Next we're going to measure the length of the occult stent, uh, the stent that we can't, we can't really uh, see by angiography, and uh, it measures out at about 13 millimeters in length, and uh, when we look at the size of the vessel distally, uh, it averages out between EEM and lumen to be roughly 2.3 millimeters uh, in diameter. So this is the proximal reference, uh, immediately proximal to that 13 millimeter length stent, and the mid wall here measures 2.6 millimeters in diameter. So we're somewhere in between there. We basically have a choice between a 225 balloon, um, a 225 by 12 balloon, and a 25 by 12 balloon. Here is the stent in the mid LAD, the previous one that was put in, and it measures uh, 18 millimeters in length. So let's first look at the distal LAD stent. Uh, we can see that the minimum cross-sectional area within the stent itself is 1.78 millimeters square. This is compared to f greater than 4 millimeters square on either end. The way we, we actually uh, check for expansion, we use the music criteria. Um, basically what it entails is you need to have complete apposition, symmetric stent expansion, this is basically no dog boning uh, of the stent. Uh, roughly if the maximum and the minimum lumen within the stent itself is greater than, compared to two, is greater than 80 percent, it's considered symmetric. Uh, and lastly, if it's a small vessel, which uh, the distal one is, 
you need 90% of the average proximal and distal reference lumen or 100% of the smallest. Uh, and typically we're going to hit the 100% of the smallest more often than 90% of the average proximal and distal reference. Uh, the reason being we often stent across bifurcations so that's easier to hit. If the vessel is greater than 9 millimeters square, uh, then you can use 80% of the average proximal and distal reference or 90% of the smallest. So for that distal stent, the occult stent, what size balloon would we use? Well, the average reference lumen is 4.06 millimeters square and the minimum CSA is 1.78. Therefore, if you compare the minimum CSA to the average reference lumen, it's only 44% or 0.44 of the average reference lumen. And remember, we need 90%. 90% of 4.06 would be 3.65 millimeters square. So when we try to break it down uh, into balloon sizing, a 225 balloon following pi r square will bring you a 3.97 millimeter square lumen, and a 25 balloon would bring you 4.9 millimeter square. So it's a choice between the two. The 225 you would have to be perfect, the 25 you wouldn't, so it's more logical to use the 25. Here is the 25 by 12 balloon. Uh, uh, that's under device detection. And this is kind of interesting. You can't see it by angiography, but by device detection, which is another facet of the sync system, you can clearly see the little short stent in the um, di uh, distal LED uh, clearly outlined there. Uh, and it was actually fairly straightforward to line up this 12 balloon um, and cover that lesion. Uh, another nice facet of the sync system is that all uh, positioning uh, dye injections with the balloon across uh, and all balloon inflations are automatically documented with the sync system. You do not need the CINI. Uh, and this, these are basically the inflations we did for the distal LED. Here's the distal LED post-inflation um, from the, the, the uh, distal lumen and the proximal lumen are unchanged but the minimum CSA has now grown to 3.92 millimeters square. So are we good? The average reference lumen again is 4.06, but the minimum CSA is now 3.92. And if you do the PD ratio here, it's 3.92 over 4.06 or 0.97. And again, 0.9 is what we're go going for. So in fact, we are done here. Let's move on to the mid stent that was deployed previously. Um, this is the distal reference, proximal reference, and the minimum CSA of this stent. Uh, and again, you can see the minimum CSA uh, is immediately distal to the diag three. Um, when we actually using strict music criteria, this actually meets it. Um, for instance, the minimum uh, the minimum cross sectional area of the stent is three point six six that is actually greater than the proximal reference or the distal reference cross-sectional area of the lumen. Um, and if you look at it angiographically, this would actually be a negative residual. This would actually be a negative 20 residual. Uh, the reason being is that we have a geographic mist proximally, but it's diffuse. And since it's diffuse, uh, we tend to think of that's, that's the normal, when in fact it's grossly abnormal. The proximal reference is in fact 77% diseased. So this is a geographic miss, um, and that's the main problem with this uh, LED stent. Geographic miss is actually quite common. Uh, the Stellar study out of 2008 uh, by Dr. Costa reported that 66.5% or about two-thirds of all stent, drug eluting stents had geographic miss. And this was associated with three times the MI and two times the TVR. Uh, so it's not a benign thing to miss the lesion. Uh, the STOP study was actually published last year showed that as far as axial uh, expansion uh, or optimal expansion, IBIS uh, gr greatly increased the proportion of cases where optimal stent cross-sectional area was achieved following high pressure deployment and post dilation. So this is the type of case where you would actually say you have a step up and a step down, uh, which most uh, uh, cardiologists might argue means that you're done, when in fact 
uh, it may just be indicative of a geographic miss. So uh, if we start uh, at the uh, inlet or proximal reference of the mid stent on the right, we're actually going to go all the way to the proximal reference on the left and we can take a look at this lesion that was untreated previously. The proximal reference of the stent uh, on the right shows a 13 millimeter square area of the vessel, 3 millimeter square area of the lumen, uh, grossly positive remodeled, highly heterogeneous plaque, um, and in fact maybe uh, a TCFA by virtual histology. Uh, the minimum cross-sectional area is actually a few frames more proximal. The vessel is smaller, now 10.8 mil millimeter square, but the lumen is also smaller at 2.59 millimeter square, and we have a concentric fibrocalcific lesion. Um, a little more proximal, we see the septal bifurcation, that large septal we were looking at earlier, still with calcification, and a big reverb waveform down at 6 o'clock. Uh, and then proximally, where we want to land the stent, the lumen is 558, vessel is 1245. Uh, so it looks like we have a fairly decent landing zone here. When we actually measure the length of the stent that we're going to need, uh, starting at uh, just a modest overlap uh, into the stent and landing uh, to the IBIS image uh, at the left, uh, we wind up getting a 28.1 millimeter uh, length stent. Uh, the mid wall for the stent would be 3.5, and again, that is the average between the vessel size and the lumen size, uh, which is a fairly good way of sizing the stent. So the first thing we need to do is uh, pre-dilate with a cutting balloon, uh, all that calcium and fibrosis. Uh, once again, uh, the sink system is very handy here. One of the extra tools that they have on board uh, is a device detector, and with that you can really ramp up your view of the stent, uh, and that mid-stent shows up uh, quite bright on the left-hand image, um, and the, the balloon inflation uh, is very nicely documented here. The next thing we need to do is position the stent. When we position the stent, um, it's very easy to see the overlap between the two and to make sure that we're landing the appropriate spot. What's interesting is when you look at the 28 stent that we used and we compared it with the predicted 28 length um, with sync, you can speed the, see that they're fairly spot on. Uh, the landing zone is pretty much exactly where you'd expect it to be. Here's the stent deployment and the overlap inflation. Again, none of this is cines. These were all documented through the sync system. And then we'll look at a post IVUS. Um, this is a post a 3 by 28 stent. Um, there's that distal stent that we looked at before, uh, looking a lot better. Uh, we're probably going to stay away from this distal edge, and we did. We all want to work on. There's the diag and this is where we actually needed to make progress and we did. Stent is much larger. This is the new stent here. Pulling through we should see the large S1 right there and then the stent should terminate here. So that's perfectly placed. When we look at the combined proximal and mid LED stent, the proximal reference now has a lumen of 6.03, distal reference 4.53, and the minimum uh, stent cross-sectional area measures out at 5.96. That means that the minimum CSA is greater than the distal reference lumen, and again this is important when you're crossing bifurcations. The luminal stenosis, the angiographic stenosis, this is again a negative residual of 13 percent, and there's no geographic miss anymore. Uh, the proximal reference uh, uh, cross-sectional area was l less than 50 percent. Here's the LED final angio. Very nice result. On to the circumflex. So here's the circumflex sync angio and this is where we're talking about uh, not having a great sync angio uh, and that's because the IVUS catheter here is kicking the guide out and we're not getting full pacification. But we still went ahead and uh, did the sync 
and this is the pull through through the OM2 lesion. You can see the great cardiac vein below. Uh, and then here is this uh, concentric calcified plaque with the soft plaque immediately proximal to it, the AV groove, and then pulling through the proximal circumflex into the left main. When we uh, try to see if we have good code registration, we'll click on the AV groove and we'll see the AV groove here and here. So this is a good co-registration as well. This is the OM lesion and we can see the distal uh, reference. We have a 5.61 millimeter square area um, in the lumen approximately is 7.47 and in the middle it's 1.84. There's also gross positive remodeling. Uh, the lesion itself in the middle the EEM is 15.04 millimeters square with a 222 degree arc of calcification. Uh, I'm sorry, 137.5 degree. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at the numbers. So the proximal reference stenosis is 47%, so that'll be a good place to land. Less than 50 is what you'd like to shoot for, less than 30 ideally. The lesion is 87% diseased. The remodeling ratio is 1.57 which usually indicates instability. The luminal stenosis is a 72%. That's what it looks like by angiography. And the midwall is 2.77. So let's get the lesion length uh, from the start of the lesion all the way up to the clean landing. This is the distal landing zone here, is 30.2 millimeters in length, quite a bit longer than you would imagine. So it's much more diffuse than you could see angiographically. Here we are lining up the stent. This is a uh, 275 or 30 by 30 stent. This is the DMI. So we're, we're lining up the stent. And what's interesting about this is in the bottom right hand corner, you can actually see when you inject dye and the stent in place, how much it actually moves between systole and diastole because it'll create little yellow dots. So if you're getting a lot of shift, it will show you that. Another very useful tool. Here's the angio of the stent in place. Again, just immediately distal to that AV groove. This is the sink estimation versus the drug eluting stent. You can actually see the black dots of the drug eluting stent. Uh, the proximal one immediately distal to the AV groove and the distal dot quite a bit downwards. Uh, and this actually lines up very nicely with the sink estimation uh, for the 275 by 30 drug eluting stent. We actually draw a line between the uh, two dots uh, of the stent, you can see that this roughly looks uh, almost exactly the same. So this is a very nice co-registration. Here is the stent deployment. Uh, again, all of this is done under floral, not under cine. And uh, the angiogram as well. And then we'll do a pullback again through the circumflex. So going to look at the, this, the distal reference. This is relatively clean. The stent was nicely landed. Uh, fairly uniform expansion throughout. Um, and then we should see the stent terminate before the AV groove here and the AV groove here. Perfect. When we look at our numbers, we can see that the distal reference lumen is 18% diseased and the lumen is 5.84. The proximal reference and again, you want to land on less than a 50, uh, ideally less than a 30. This is 39%. That's not too shabby. Uh, the minimum CSA within the stent itself is 5.94, which is greater than the distal reference lumen, which is ideal. So minimum CSA is greater than distal reference lumen. The luminal stenosis, this is the angiographic stenosis, is 9%. Um, in case you're wondering how to actually calculate uh, an angiographic stenosis from IVIS, it's basically averaging the lumen proximally and distally, comparing it to the lumen in the middle. So it would be average reference uh, lumen cross-sectional area minus minimum cross-sectional area divided by average reference again. That's what will give you the luminal stenosis. The plaque plus media, the cross-sectional area of the lesion itself, is unchanged. Uh, this is actually a big deal. What this means is we've actually gone up over four millimeter square in area but none of that was plaque loss. If you look at the total plaque plus media cross-sectional area, it's unchanged pre and post dilation. 
what has gone up is the actual EEM cross-sectional area, directly proportionate to the lumen cross-sectional area. And that's ideally what you'd like to see. You don't want to see plaque loss because that could trigger PMI. There's no geographic miss. Again, we're done. So good stent. Here's the final angio of the OM. Very nice result. Conclusions. Uh, for this patient, we used a total of 150 cc's of dye for the diagnostic and the intervention, including two fractional flow reserves to two different vessels, IVUS to two different vessels, treatment to two different vessels. So that's actually not bad at all. Uh, the total pr procedure time from the time we put the patient on a table to the time we took the patient off the table was 90 minutes. Um, combined diagnostic and intervention. The total floral time was 30 minutes. Um, the patient did follow up at three months uh, office. He was asymptomatic. No further tests were warranted at that time, and the exam was unremarkable. So a fairly successful story. And lastly, uh, for the final conclusions, what we found is that by using FFR and IVUS, we were able to safely and effectively treat multivessel disease um, in a time-effective manner. The SYNC system provided important information on the occult stent and was able to accurately gauge the lengths of the stents needed for both vessels. Uh, so it was incredibly useful uh, to do this uh, with the sync system, and we think that uh, uh, its utility is is formidable. And with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for your time, and uh, I will uh, I will be submitting another one soon. Thank you.